Thank you, Moderator Sotole. Uh, my name is Edgar, as, in, as indicated, and um, I'm here in my capacity as chairperson of a resource that Cities Alliance has created for itself called the Cities Alliance Africa Think Tank. Uh, we've been working the last year to try and figure out how to best think the African urban problematic as part of a larger process within Cities Alliance to continuously deepen its own understanding about the changing context, but also the best means for intervention. So the purpose of the presentation today is really to share with you some initial thoughts of ours in what we call a narrative exploration of African urbanization, or how do we turn towards the prospect of fostering sustainable urbanization in Africa. The report is extensive. It will take considerable time to go through the detail of it. So what I will present this afternoon is a truncated version of that to at least give you a sense of what the core arguments are as part of our own internal processes of sharing these debates, opening it up, advancing it, and going through um, a, a process of refinement over the next few months. The purpose of the think tank is, is, is really, a, it's a wonderful privilege to be in this position where an institution as important and as inclusive as Cities Alliance explicitly wants to be provoked. It wants to be engaged with critical thinking, with criticism, as a mechanism to ensure that its own programming that happens across the world, but particularly in Africa, is as sharp as possible. The think tank comprises of a wide range of expertise, and I'm not going to introduce the think tank members. There's a folder within your pack that says a little bit more about who's involved. Now, the starting point for the narrative is a recognition that as Africans, we have often tended to look in the rearview mirror, that we've not been engaged enough with the future. Of course, in the last few years, there's been a remarkable shift in discourse, disposition and attitude, led by the African Union in partnership with a whole range of pan-African institutions, we've been asked as Africans to reflect on the next century through the document called Agenda 2063. And what is very significant about this process is that for the first time, African leaders are taking urbanization seriously. And as this one quote indicates, it is central to the vision of where Africa will be in the next 40 years. Now, for me, what this represents is an important cultural shift, that instead of thinking of ourselves as, if you will, the vulnerable members of the global community, the marginal part of the global economy, the left-behind region of the world, we can now face the world and the future with a profound sense of confidence. But this is not a confidence that is born out of thin air or a confidence that is about hubris. This is a confidence that recognizes our painful, complex, tortured history as this particular artistic intervention reflects, where the subaltern, where the region of the world that has been most violently oppressed is standing on its own feet and it's saying that we will define a future cognizant of our history but also absolutely clear that we can lead boldly into the future and probably solve some of the most complex global problems through our own cultural and human resources. And it is this spirit that underpins the thinking of the, think of, of the work that we are doing. Now, central to this, of course, is the fact that across the continent, we've got a fascinating and a very distinctive demographic structure. What the figure on the left reflects is, is the reality that Africa will have the fastest growing labor force of all world regions over the next 50 years. And in fact, if you consider that at the moment, 50% of Africa's population is younger than 19 years of age, we've got an incredibly potential rich future ahead of us. The key challenge is how do we harness that future? This, the, the graph on the right hand side reflects the low base of which African mobile internet connectivity is operating from. But at the same time, as you can see, it is anticipated that in just the next decade, 
we will go up to 75% of Africa's population accessing the internet through mobile internet, and this is based on economist data uh, from last year. Now, these factors in combination with what we've seen recently with world leaders like Zuckerberg embracing this particular distinctive intersection of technologically aware yet youthful people that has got an entrepreneurial um, energy and, if you will, determination, tells us that there's something very important taking place that we need to pay attention to, and I would argue that should be at the core of the sense of confidence about the future that we are trying to instill. And of course, this can only take root and manifest to its full potential within our urban areas. And so it raises questions about how do we bring that about? And at the heart of that question is the challenge of leadership. We heard this this morning. We've seen evidence of that leadership emerging. But I think it is be beholden to us as Africans to remind ourselves that we've got a rather dismal track record when it comes to our post-colonial era. In the immediate colonial, decolonial struggles and in the immediate uh, post-colonial aftermath, we've got, we had an exemplary cadre of leadership and then it kind of went pear-shaped very, very badly for a long time. And so we have to revisit the question of the kind of cultural confidence uh, that we require and what kind of leadership can deliver that. And in our view, this is a leadership that is rooted in competence, but very, very importantly, understands that leadership has to be distributed in society. You have to find leadership within all domains, whether it is civil society, religious institutions, um, or other business sectors and so forth. But I guess for the context of this forum and debates we are uh, engaged with over the next few days, the question really is how do we build a confidence at the level of the nation state, at the level of multi-level governance to say that we are indeed committed to this and the evidence of that is what was invoked this morning as a commitment to open data and transparency. Now, in the Sorry, I'm just going to get my technology to work. Um, in, in, in light of this approach, what the think tank is trying to do is to say that the challenges are so vast. What are the most strategic opportunities to intervene, but intervene in a way that will deal with the systemic drivers of the dysfunctional urbanization that we see in evidence in most parts of the world? So, of course, uh, uh, the Af Agenda 2063 gives us an incredibly powerful discursive opportunity to foster a new set of debates and discussions. And what is interesting is that if you look at what has happened over the last year and a half through various global convenings, and as we pivot towards Habitat 3 that will take place next month in Quito, that there's an incredible sense of continuity between our vision for the future and what the global discussion is about the fundamental elements of sustainable development. And it is this confluence that we want to activate in programmatic terms. Now, one of our important institutions, and uh, they'll, they'll respond to, to this talk uh, in a second, is of course the UN Economic Commission for Africa. And they've been incredibly busy over the last period to try and get to the core of realizing Agenda 2063, and all of that turns on this idea of what they call structural transformation. Now, what does this refer to? There's some technical jargon, which I'll try and avoid, but essentially what it reflects is that we've got an anomalous economic growth trajectory in Africa. So we are still predominantly dependent on primary commodities, both within agriculture and in minerals, and what has typically historically been the case is that you then build out an industrial base of those primary sectors, and that is the mechanism through which you then employ a large and growing working class that is able to achieve upward mobility through education and health investments. Now, this industrialization has not taken place in the post-colonial era. And to be frank, most economists are a little bit stumped about this. We've got some ideas about why it's happened, but we don't really understand the fundamental drivers of it, be that as it may. It has been recognized, given that the labor force will treble in the next 40 years, that unless we are able to crack the structural problem in the form of African economies, we are doomed. 
And so a lot of work is going into how to rethink the fundamentals of economic policy, whether it's industrial policy, trade policy, macroeconomic policy, and so forth, but also to do that in a context where we're recognizing the global economy has got to reorient itself onto a sustainability pathway. And this is all furtive work that is giving us an incredibly valuable opportunity to not just think about the structural transition, but to think about the spatiality of it. In other words, what is the territorial underpinning of achieving this structural transformation. And it is this debate that we believe needs to be explored and unpacked and refined within national and local contexts. Now, at the heart of it is this incredibly depressing statistic, that if you look at the post-colonial era, you will see that even before we managed to crawl, manufacturing has been on a decline. How remarkable is that? If you think of the growth of African populations, growth in the economy, that we have from day one in the post-colonial era been singularly incapable of generating a manufacturing backbone. Now, if you then turn to another report and another body of work that we are drawing on, um, which is the Africa Economic Outlook 2016 that was published by the OECD, the African Development Bank, and UNDP, they developed this year for us a really useful way of understanding the unique conditions in different parts of the continent. Now, we know that for sustainable development, you need growth. You need women to be educated, as we heard this morning. And what happens when women get educated is that fertility rates drop. And that's the key, because as soon as fertility rates drop, women can enter the labor force, and you get a much higher level of productivity in the economy. Now, what you will see with this table is that there are only five African countries that manifest an economic structure that is defined as diverse. In other words, it is not just dependent on primary commodities, but it has a little bit of everything, and that gives it a certain resilience or robustness. Almost all of the other African countries are struggling with this. The exception would be, if you will, the natural resource-based ones, which can achieve high growth rates because of oil or gas, but of course, it still has an incredibly lopsided economy, but they can then reflect reasonably high uh, uh, gross national income data per capita. Now, all I want you to take away from this is that we are not getting the fertility rates to come down. And that's a serious, serious developmental impediment because it means that even before we've started, demand for basic services and other human development inputs is growing exponentially, but we don't have the economic base to respond to that. And our most important resource, our human capital, is underutilized because of the fertility burden. So in light of this context, we think that there are two things that is really, really has to focus the minds. The one is obviously education, and the second is to think in very precise terms about the infrastructure investment agenda. And I'll spend the rest of my talk just, to, just reflecting on what are ways into that particular area so that we can, in fact, realize the trajectory to sustainability that Africa demands. Now, to give us some sense of where we are at, I'm going to go very quickly through what we know about the state of differential urbanization. Now, for this audience, you will all be familiar with this, so I'm literally going to run through the slides so that I can get into the core propositions that the think tank is putting forward. This is just the numbers. The key takeaway from this is that it's not just an urban question because of our robust demographic profile, both rural and urban populations are growing. So let's keep that feature in mind, and particularly the interfaces between rural and urban areas. The most important statistic, the vast majority of our labor force are trapped in what the ILO calls vulnerable employment. In other words, this is employment where you are, where you are subject to the vagaries of opportunity, and you have very low wages, and it's irregular. So you can't plan. You can't manage your household. And 63% of the labor force falls into this category. Another way of talking about it, and there'll be a panel after tea break on this, is that the vast majority of people are trapped in informal jobs. Now, unfortunately, and this is the connect to the global debates, this is not unique to sub-Saharan Africa. All global South world regions manifest the same phenomena, which goes to the heart, to the current form of, globe, of the global economy, which is on the one hand highly extractive, but also profoundly exploitative 
in terms of labor, and it reproduces at a systemic level vast scales of inequality. So there's a much bigger core problem in the global debate that we also need to attend to, but our interest is what are the spatial manifestations within the urban context of this phenomenon. This is what I've mentioned before, the growth in the, in the demographic profile, which means we're going to go from 400 million to 1.2 billion people in the labor force. And this is the other depressing statistics, which shows that if you look at the high growth era that everyone refers to as Africa's takeoff, Africa on the rise since 2000, you'll see that in only the services sector have we been able to generate some jobs. And this again reinforces this idea that we are really, really struggling to transition from primary to secondary and tertiary sectors. And then predictably, of course, most Africans, like other world regions, the vast majority of people in cities do live in slum conditions because they've got informal jobs, they can't afford the reproductive cost of living in a formal house. So in summary, the story of Africa's urbanization in different world regions at different stages of development is one of informality in the economy, in how people live, and in terms of then the aggregate weight that Africa has in the global context. So as you can see, even though we are 20% now almost of the global population, and we will go up to 40% um, uh, uh, by the end of the century, we only represent 25 to 3% of the global economy. It's ridiculous. Right? Absolutely ridiculous. And so we've got to really begin to think through this economic question in relation to how urbanization is the key, to, the way we manage urbanization to, to address this transition. So then to get to some of the core ideas in terms of the argument. Essentially, we start off with this idea of sustainable urbanism, which of course uh, deals with some of the, 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 the common themes. But we see the, the, the imperative of environmental sustainability as, in fact, our cue to pivot towards the imperatives of the green or the sustainable economy. Basic services are essential as a foundation for social inclusion, and employment, 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 employment has got to be our mantra. How do we create jobs for these uh, um, uh, hundreds of, 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 of millions of Africans that will enter the labor force? And finally, which is at the core of the Cities Alliance agenda, institutional competence. And this is not just the multi-level government system, it is also civil society and the private sector and everything else in between. So the argument is that we've got to absolutely build on the gain that we have from the Sustainable Development Goals, which is Goal 11 and its sub-targets, that we've got to think through um, how we utilize um, what is available for us within the different territories that we have, how we sort of activate this idea of joint up infrastructure investments, and then what that means for recalibrating in a profound way the multi-level governance systems in all of our countries. And finally, what kind of human resource strategy, again referencing what, what Billy said this morning, uh, well, uh, how do we professionalize local government? The core idea is that there's two movements that's required, what we call localization. This is to build autonomy at the grassroots level to deal with a massive service delivery deficit and at the same time build a certain kind of social entrepreneurialism and secondly, what we call regional transitions. And I'll say more about each. The regional transitions, in fact, is a response to an international discussion about how do you build cities in a way that is resource efficient but also is carbon efficient. So it's not just about low carbon cities, it's also about resource efficiency per unit, and this goes to the heart of the kind of infrastructure investments that you make. So we then adapt the UNEP definition of the green economy to spatialize that, so it's low carbon, resource efficient, socially inclusive, but also spatially integrated. And this is the key, because unless we are able to effect spatial justice, we won't be able to reverse the structural drivers. And then we take this number that the World Bank has given us a couple of years ago of a deficit of, of about 50 billion per annum in, in, in infrastructure spend, and we say, can you rethink that investment, not just to say how do we meet needs, but how do we do it in a way that activates employment and, if you will, labor-intensive forms of urban development. And this takes us to this discussion that you can disaggregate every single infrastructure investment in terms of its technological intensiveness, 
um, and in terms of uh, the scale at which you operate the system. And the localization and the regional transitions allows us to inter, what, what, what the technical jargon is, to create interoperability between what gets happened, done at the neighborhood level and how you scale that to the larger urban system. So the three systems we focus on is energy, mobility, and ICT as w with the most profound catalytic effect. But these have to be thought of and planned and managed at a city regional scale. That if you reproduce the extreme uh, fragmentation that we see in most cities, you will, not get the, you will not be able to optimize the efficiencies. This then gives you the entry point to begin to tap the benefits of the land use value changes that will happen if you can calibrate revenue generation off these investments. And finally, you've got to understand that this stuff does not fall from the sky. You have to create the knowledge ecologies at the city regional scale between universities, think tanks, NGOs, social movements, private sector, and public systems. And if we look at the international discussion around the fourth industrial revolution or disruptive technologies, we know that mobile internet and renewable energy are probably the two most important technologies to take cognizance of. And of course, many of you will be familiar with some of the experiments in East Africa, uh, uh, like MCOPA Solar and so forth. At the heart of this is a social revolution that recognizes that social organization that is connected with uh, fostering social capital, investing it, ICT awareness, and very, very importantly, a certain kind of spatial design literacy at the grassroots level embedded in community organizations is what will shift uh, the institutional capacity. On transport, we make a strong case for TOD and to really take seriously the idea of the inverted mobility paradigm so that we take what the majority of urban dwellers walk and we take their needs as the most important demand in the city that has to be resolved. And then on ICT, we draw heavily on the work from the most recent World Bank report that demonstrates how strategic ICT investments is key to growth, jobs, and services. And then I've already made the point about land use regulation and the importance of that and regional innovation systems. So I'll just make one point about this and then I'll conclude. The core idea here is that if we look at the scale of the deficits on basic services, that the only resource we really have at the end of the day is, oh, for the translators. So I'm trapped at the moment between my time card here and the translators need me to slow down. So five more. Okay, okay, okay. Thanks. So the, the central idea here is that we can rethink the service delivery problematic as, in fact, an opportunity to build a new generation of grassroots organizations that take on the form of social enterprises. And if we uh, then think this through, it becomes clear that these institutional forms, let's, let's say it's a, it's a kind of civil society organizations 2.0, that this then creates a mechanism for co-producing service delivery with local authorities in a system where more and more power and resources gets devolved down. Now, why is this important? The simple reason is that most local authorities in Africa simply doesn't have the tax base to ensure that you provide universal services. So you have to draw down other forms of investment and capital that's embedded in communities, but you use that cleverly to give these unemployable young people the opportunity to figure out how do you grow and build social enterprises. And that practice, that embodied practice of creating this new form of service delivery is in fact the key to creating the economic architecture for the kind of economy that will make sense in Africa. If I had more time, I could illustrate this through various examples, but essentially we say that, you know, what makes for a viable, vibrant, livable community is not rocket science. We, we all are human, we know that we want safety and well-being, we want a decent jobs, we want our kids to go to good schools, and we want to be able to be with our loved ones and our cultural attach attachments in viable, safe, green, healthy public spaces. Not rocket science, right? So why don't we get the people 
who will directly experience this to drive the planning and the maintenance of these, plan of these processes. Why not? That's our biggest resource. That's our only asset we have in a context of scarce financial resources. And that is what will set off the most important trigger, which is as people grow pride in where they live, in their neighborhoods, they will invest. The evidence is very clear uh, from other world regions around that. So the final part then of the narrative is to say that, of course, this can't just happen overnight, that there's a crucial role for national governments in concert with local government associations and other spheres of government and other forms of government, parastatals and so forth, to begin to realign the existing investments that take place, but in a much more spatially intelligent and coordinated way. So we think that if tweaking some of the national planning system instruments will give us that benefit. So at the apex, all governments have to produce national sustainable development strategies. This is a requirement by the UN. It has different names in different countries, uh, but this stems from uh, uh, the Rio summit and the follow-ups in Johannesburg in 2012. But very seldom do these national perspectives that now has to align itself with Agenda 2063 have a spatial underpinning, have an understanding of how different kinds of territorial manifestations can play a part to achieve the national goals. And so we call for uh, uh, that kind of analysis, which in turn has got to inform and be informed by both national and rural policies and then we get to the crux of the matter, integrated infrastructure planning programs. This is the key, because if you don't do your energy systems, your mobility systems, and your ICT systems, amongst others, in an integrated synergistic fashion, you're going to lose out on the fantastic multiplier dynamics that's available if we get this right. And of course, underpinning all of this, it is absolutely necessary to look at next generation data management and data gathering instruments, which we will hear about more in the next few days. And then finally, we have to build the back end of this in terms of the human capacity. So as a start, let's recognize the important achievement of the African Union through the African Charter for the Values of Decentralization. But then let's also see how do we take seriously building the capacity of our people and their organizations and associations. And finally, can we create extraordinary mechanisms to generate the, the leadership that is required to both embody and to drive this vision and that is willing to experiment and to innovate? Thank you.